Hey everybody, this is uh, Dean Cohen, and I'd like to welcome you back to another one of our conversations. Today, we're going to be speaking with uh, one of our own uh, from a Hopkins point of view, and that's Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo. Uh, Dr. Nuzzo is a senior scholar at the Hopkins Center for Health Security. She's an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering and the Department of Epidemiology in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I tried to memorize all that, but I wasn't, uh, I had to check my notes. She's also a senior fellow in global health at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she's done a great deal of work on global health security. Uh, she is a leading, the, she is the lead epidemiologist for the Hopkins COVID-19 Testing Insights Initiative. Uh, she co-leads the development of the first ever global health security index. Uh, I could I could go on and on. She's also has a background uh, working in government as the uh, as a public health epidemiologist for the city of New York. So, uh, in addition to all that, she is a uh, proud uh, DRPH for, in epidemiology from the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So, Dr. Nuzzo. What a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So um, for everybody out there, just uh, we'll follow our usual rules, which is uh, you can put questions in the Q&A function anytime you wish. Uh, and I will, I will call on those. Please identify yourself. I privilege students uh, throughout this. Uh, we'll have a more or less general kind of conversation and then for about 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, and then we'll move to the Q&A. So uh, usually a good idea to put questions and thoughts into the Q&A function sooner rather than later. So let me, um, so many questions I'd like to ask. First, uh, just overall, you know, from the point of view of uh, a Martian, um, how, how does the global pandemic look, or does it even make sense to talk about having a, a global perspective on the pandemic as opposed to a set of what are essentially national perspectives? I think we need both. Um, I mean, clearly we're in a global situation and um, from the vantage point of any any country, um, you know, that country is not going to be safe, ready, normal um, until this ends, you know, our, our acute worries about the event ends. And so that really does require a global perspective. And I think part of why we have struggled to get our arms around this has been our failure to take a global perspective. Um, you know, countries often in these sort of challenging situations kind of look inward and it's understandable to a point because leaders first perspective, you know, first responsibilities are to the people who elect them. But the truth is, the tools, the strategies, um, the resources that countries need in order to combat this are, are global. I mean, we're seeing that right now with vaccines. You know, it's it's one thing for countries to purchase it, but it comes from a, a global supply chain. Um, we're seeing, we've seen that with medicines and personal protective equipment, um, testing reagents, all sorts of things. So um, the absence, I think, of really global approaches has been challenging. Um, and where we are right now is it's not looking good in, um, many parts of the world. I think the countries that have been fastest to roll out vaccines are breathing a bit of a sigh of relief more so than others, um, but we know that the, the need remains great and that there's just not nearly enough vaccines for the world. And so as we see countries heating up in terms of case numbers, um, thinking that they had previously been sort of spared the worst impacts, it just, I think, is a reminder that this is very much not over. Is, uh, um, you know, one thing I've found difficult to understand <clears throat> to the extent I've, I've followed global statistics is why some countries, setting aside vaccination, okay, it's easy to understand why things have gotten a lot better in Israel or the UAE mm -hmm. or the UK or in, or in fact the United States. But in other countries, you know, for example, for quite a while, uh, India seemed to be doing remarkably well, and it wasn't because there was a massive vaccine rollout. And then all of a sudden they have this skyrocketing um, incidence of coronavirus. Or similarly, you, know, you, don't, you get the sense that the, the profile of the pandemic looks different, say in some parts of Africa, as opposed to other parts, as opposed to Europe. Do, 
do we actually have a good handle on why that's the case? No, not fully. I mean, I think there's probably a mix of factors involved. Um, the, the key one though, is that this is not over. And um, the vast majority of people on this world, you know, in this world remain susceptible to this virus. So, you know, even countries that have been successful at limiting the importation of the virus, that they've responded very aggressively domestically to limit the spread, I mean, they remain vulnerable. The non-pharmaceutical interventions that countries are using, travel restrictions, uh, you know, social distancing measures, those are all pause buttons. They're not cures. They don't stop the virus. They just slow and in some cases pause the spread. As soon as you release those measures, there is the risk that the virus will rip through, frankly. Um, so I think there are some countries that have done well in part because they have been um, dogged about maintaining those measures, but they will remain at risk until they vaccinate their population, frankly. Um, countries like India, I mean, I think there is some um, kind of episodic circulation, possibly weather related, possibly social, um, and just in terms of, of how we gather and at different times of year. Um, there's also discrepancies in how much countries are looking for the virus. Um, we know that there are different vulnerabilities for, for the spread of the virus, like density and, and housing structure and you know, a number of things like that. Um, and then we also know that countries have different level of vulnerabilities to severe illness, which can make the spread in some places look more obvious than in others. Um, we tend to overfind uh, severe cases um, and, and don't find enough of, of the mild cases. But I think that you know, India is a great example of, of how all countries remain vulnerable. And, and I think the, the earlier narratives that we heard that some countries may have sort of just escaped it, I think were false narratives. They were, they were observations too early in the story. And so I do re remain worried around countries that either you know, haven't had large surges of cases yet and, and their population is unvaccinated because you know, they, they remain vulnerable. Again, let me just uh, remind people in the audience, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please put it in the Q&A and I'll tackle, tackle them as they, uh, as they come in. Um, so, the, I mean, it, it is, to, to me at least, it's astonishing that you have vaccines that are as effective as they are, particularly the mRNA vaccines being developed in an astonishingly short period of time. Um, would you say that there's been the same kind of advance in therapeutics? No, I mean, I think not nearly where we'd like to be. I mean, we don't really have anything that can, um, you know, prevent infection. It'd be nice to have antivirals that can do that. We have um, some options for making people better able to survive their infection, but um, they're limited in, in our ability to scale and limited in our ability to deliver. Um, I think the monoclonal antibodies are probably um, some of the more promising, but um, you know they need to be delivered by <laughs> intravenously, which really lim limits the, the ability of people to receive them and to receive them early in their course of illness. I mean, that's, that's been one of the challenges here. Um, and you can imagine in, in places where um, there's less healthcare infrastructure, it would be even more challenging. Hmm. Um, let me ask a, a more of a, I guess the sociological kind of question. Um, as this is played out, it, you know, it, it does seem to me we see differences between how doctors sometimes think about uh, the pandemic and how epidemiologists do. Does that make sense to you, or you think that's incorrect? I... Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what, but I mean, there's the, the old adage about you know whether you're treating the patient in front of you or if you're thinking in terms of the millions and billions of people in the world and you know, strategies to protect billions may not, may conflict with what it's at odds with, you know, when you're just trying to save the life of the person in front of you. So can you tease out how that, how that affects how, um, how yeah, people I mean, think about control measures and, you know, vaccination and a whole bunch of other things? Sure. I mean, well, so with vaccination, um, actually, here's an interesting um, paradox of vaccination. So in the US and in many countries, um, because we have limited um, supplies of vaccines, we started with 
uh, the people who are most likely to suffer severe illness complications from infection. Um, so uh, the single biggest risk factor for severe illness is advanced age. So we started with um, the oldest Americans. Um, those are not necessarily the people who are transmitting the virus, driving transmission. They may be the people who have largely been at home for the last year because they've been worried about protecting themselves. So I often get questions about, well, you know, we have rolled out so many vaccines. How come we're not seeing a sharper drop in cases? Well, we're not vaccinating with the strategy of trying to reduce transmission. We are vaccinating with the strategy of trying to save lives. Um, and it will be some time until we you know, expand further and further the age groups of people um, who are able to receive vaccine. And as of now, um, all adults 16 and older are eligible to be vaccinated in the United States. That doesn't mean they're able to be vaccinated in the United States, but they're eligible. You know, as more age groups get vaccinated, we should see the case numbers decline. Um, some places didn't, you know, Indonesia actually initially prioritized younger folks um, for vaccines because they wanted to have an impact on transmission. They were worried about young people going out and potentially bringing the virus back to their elderly relatives. Um, so they initially started vaccinating. When their vaccine supplies became constrained as, as has in now a number of countries because of some you know, safety concerns and production issues, um, they did switch to now use the, the smaller do amount of doses on older more susceptible populations, but you can see that tension there. Yeah. Is there a kind of a tipping point phenomenon in all this? I mean, I'm following, uh, I got the Pfizer vaccine. So needless to say, I've been devouring the Israeli data um, on it. And, it, you know, the thing that really does, that strikes me is that there just comes a certain point when all of a sudden uh, their case rates go down, the hospitalization yeah. rates go down yeah. and mortality yeah. rates go down. Doesn't that, will we be likely to encounter something similar, do you think? Yes. Um, you know, you see that, and it's a product of both uh, protection with vaccines and how many people have been protected, immunized. Um, and it's also a function, you know, a function of how many people have already been infected. So they have natural immunity. Um, it's also not just about adding those two numbers together and reaching, you know, you often hear quoted in the media, like we need 75% or whatever the percentage is that gets thrown around a percentage of the, the population vaccinated. It's actually a lot more complicated than that because it, it depends also on our degree of connectivity, how likely we are to encounter people um, in new social networks um, who may be susceptible. So it, it's a little bit more complicated and in some places you may need greater than that. In some places you actually, may need lower than that. But I think at some point it will become quite obvious that we are um, you know, approaching a level of, of protection in our community where in our country where we are less acutely worried about the spread of this virus. So, so I'm sure there's a question that uh, A, you probably get all the time and B, probably annoys you because I think it annoys most epidemiologists that I've spoken with. And that is, okay, what are the markers where you will say, you know, maybe there's a new normal, but we're going to be back to something yeah. that sort of approximates uh, life as it was in 2018? Yeah, um, that question doesn't annoy me. I think it's a really important question. And I think we need to define what that is, because I, I do worry that not defining it makes it seem like this is never go we're never going to get ahead of this this is this is going to be the life that we're living forever and i think that that's actually um serving as a disincentive for a number of people particularly on the vaccine front i spent a lot of time talking to vaccine hesitant groups and i can tell you their their perception that the vaccine doesn't change anything um is frequently one of the reasons why they don't think it's worth getting vaccinated. Um, that's just simply not true. The vaccine changes everything. Um, but we just haven't yet defined um, what sort of an acceptable level of risk will be such that we stop hearing about, worrying about, fretting about this virus. Um, my colleagues, some of my colleagues um, have, you know, uh, authored a, a, a op-ed in the Washington Post suggesting that when um, disease incidence approaches seasonal influenza, a disease for which we don't main and maintain restrictions, we don't make people wear masks. Um, when it approaches that, where we're about 10,000, I think that's about 10,000 cases per day, that that's a reasonable 
point at which it's, you know, if you wanna wear a mask, that's great, but you know, no one can make you wear it. Um, you know, that sounds reasonable to me, but I think we need to agree. And, and part of the problem, I think why we haven't defined this is um, we all set the kind of risk <laughs> benefit uh, like titrate, we, we all titrate around those those questions differently. Um, for some people, that may not seem acceptable. When you pose, you know, well, you don't do this for flu. Um, I think we also have to recognize the fact that we treat risks of known uh, quantities of familiar familiar risks differently than we create than we treat new risks. Um, and this is a new virus and people feel differently about something that's new to them. So I think it's really important. I think that the seasonal flu metric is one. I, I don't personally feel that we are going to get to zero anytime soon um, and, and don't think that that's the appropriate uh, measure. But there are people in my field who do very much think that that is, that is the goal. So I think we do need as a country to, to better define this because I think it's, it's hindering our ability just to make progress. Uh, you know, I uh, I would agree with that. I, I mean, I found it interesting reading people like Liana Wen or uh, mm -hmm. Ashish Jha, who's the mm -hmm. head of the Brown uh, School of Public Health, both of whom I think have been increasingly forceful in making the case that, you know, you shouldn't be telling people that you've been vaccinated now do everything exactly as you've done it before. Right. And, and and it it doesn't really fit human nature. I mean, one thing I've, I've we've been walking every day pretty much uh, other than in really bad weather. Um, it's just very noticeable, fewer people are masking now. I mean, the people yeah. are gonna, people will vote with their masks. Um, and, you know, outside that's fine. I mean, that's fine. Yeah, From an yeah, epidemiologic yeah. standpoint, that's fine. If you were sitting next to somebody, you know, at a sporting event and breathing in their face for a few hours, even if you're outside wearing a mask would be good, but walking the dog, you don't need one. And I, I think that's actually been part of the problem. I think some people feel like, you know, no tolerance is important because once you, you know, allow any daylight, people will just throw all caution to the wind. I, I personally think that's a very paternalistic view. I think people can handle some nuance. They just need to be empowered with information. And so if not wearing a mask while you're walking the dog makes you better, you know, have more fortitude to wear it when you're going, you know, to grocery shopping, I think for, for me, that, that seems a more realistic approach. I, I must say that's very encouraging to hear because truth is I haven't been wearing my mask outdoors <laughs> a whole lot. Um, but, you know, that, that's an interesting thing. Do, I, I am curious, is there a debate within the epidemiological community about, which, is, I mean, it's probably a little bit too early to do, you know, what the military would call an after action review where you say, okay, where did we do well? Where did we screw yeah. up? Is, is that debate, here is that debate coming what will be the big issues do you think i mean what are your personal lessons learned yeah so on the outdoor masks i think there's there's a growing consensus of people saying listen you know we take a in epidemiology there's there's something called harm reduction where it's it's not to say you know it's an abstinence only approach but here are more or less risky things to do and a harm reduction approach um, would view outdoor masks as probably not that important compared to other things. And so we choose to emphasize the other things as a way to make sure that people are, you know, that they're more likely to comply with that as opposed to saying, here's this endless list of things and you have to do them all. Um, I think I have just seen with my colleagues that I think there's a growing consensus that, you know, we should actually list, lift outdoor mask mandates to the extent that they exist, um, you know, and they still do exist in, in a number of places. Obviously, if you're in very crowded circumstances, <laughs> masks are, you know, helpful. Um, but generally speaking, most of us uh, can keep our distance when we're outside and it's well ventilated outside. So that's why it's it's not as necessary. But there are, you know, if you're in an indoor space, it, it is quite necessary. So I think for me, I think it's important to make that distinction because otherwise I think it's just absolutely exhausting. Um, I think the areas though, where the fights are still very real, um, well, schools, I mean, schools are, in my view, the, the, the biggest failure of this response that we have just kicked that can down the road mm. and basically come up with no plan to get our children back into school five days a week, which they, which they need where they need to be. Yeah. 
yeah, I, uh, I, I, that makes sense to me as well. Well, why don't we, um, let me move to some of the questions again. I would ask people want to uh, ask questions, please use the Q and A function. Um, uh, first one's from Joe O'Muller. Um, I am a dual MA, MS, PH candidate at Johns Hopkins Sice and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Good to hear. Studying climate change and epidemiology. Living in Bologna this year, recent travels to South Africa and observing the level of misinformation in the United States has exposed me to high levels of public disbelief in public health measures, data, and the importance of vaccines. As a global health professional and epidemiologist, what methods do you find most effective in combating misinformation around the world? More specifically, how do you convince different populations that vaccines are safe, effective, and necessary? Yeah. It's a big, that's a big, it's a big yeah, issue. That, that is the biggie. Um, I will say, before I get to what I think we as public health people can do, um, there are other issues though. I think this issue, this problem is bigger than the public health and medical community can even possibly tackle. The spread of myths and in many cases, disinformation, you know, intention to, to mislead um, is a global problem that I think has been accelerated by this, by social media. Um, and, and, uh, we need to fix that problem. Um, this is not some, I mean, I have just been, never in my career have I seen so much disinformation as I have this time. And it's it's not just, you know, one-off people sp spreading things that they think are true. These are concerted, orchestrated, highly financed and highly um, organized groups uh, you know, spreading information at a pace with a level of resources that the medical and public health community can't possibly match. It's an asymmetric fight. Um, it is also one that increasingly nation states are using, right? So we know that that governments are, are spreading disinformation for the purposes to harm. Um, so again, this is, this is a larger political issue that needs to be fixed. And then there's politics. There are the fact that political leaders have chosen in this pandemic to politicize uh, the pandemic, you know, to, to openly question the existence of the virus and the harms that it caused, to question the, even the most basic of protective measures like mask wearing. Um, and, you know, um, in my view, have really abdicated their responsibility to protect their constituents. So that's um, another issue. You know, uh, could I just ask you to expand on something that you just said? Um, you talked about governments you know, actively pursuing disinformation. Would you be willing to speak more to that, add a little bit more detail on that? Sure, I mean, I think it's been documented that, um, you know, there is often foreign intelligence behind some of the, um, so for instance, uh, disinformation about vaccines, that these are, um, you know, campaigns aimed at um, sowing discord and, and spreading misinformation and, you know, whether it's it's truthfully to to change the percentage of people who are willing to get vaccinated or just to sow um, you know division is a little bit uh, unclear, but nonetheless it is not without you know um, uh, it is something that is you know being unleashed by by foreign governments um, and you know that's not something that you can risk communicate your way out of fully. It's not like. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, health officials at local health departments can possibly combat, you know, a Russian disinformation campaign. Um, we saw this even actually before COVID and uh, measles outbreaks that were happening, uh, you know, public health officials reported seeing um, really sophisticated materials undermining the messages that they were issuing, in some cases spoofing their actual email addresses and, and letterhead. I mean, really incredibly sophisticated materials that just, you know, was clearly beyond just some, you know, one-off person with a grievance um, spewing lies on, on Facebook. So that is the larger thing. But from the public health perspective, you know, what can we do in the meantime until, until governments act to address the, the problem of, of mis and disinformation? Um, I have found a few things. Uh, one is that, first of all, we have to approach this topic with empathy and recognize that people, um, first of all, may be seeking information and questions are welcome. You just want them to get the answers to their questions from credible sources. Um, 
I think starting from that place of empathy, not vilifying people for making different risk benefit choices than you and just continuing to provide information is important and to, to speak to them as another human being. Um, that has been really critical. I also think that we have to make sure we don't inadvertently amplify disinformation. Um, so if you're on social media and you see something false, don't retweet it and try to correct it. Just spread the right information and keep doing that over and over again. And talk to everybody, talk to everybody you meet about um, these issues and what it means for you personally. Speak on a personal level and you know, you're more likely to connect with somebody by sharing your perspectives in addition to the facts. You know, I um, it, the thought occurs to me that uh, I, I, I suspect that uh, the, the sort of disinformation campaigns you're talking about, you know, the epidemiologists who are interested in social media and stuff are probably well aware of that and sensitive to it. I, I am not sure that that's one of the things that governments really think hard about. And it's part of the totality, totality of a relationship with other countries. And uh, you see this in a number of other related areas. I mean, you see it actually in all kinds of cybersecurity areas where, you know, people say, well, that's a cybersecurity issue that's somehow separable from the larger relationship. The point is it can not it can never be separable from the, the larger relationship. And I think it's, it's one of the reasons why it's good that uh, you and I are having this conversation. And I'm glad to see that we have students who are engaged at both schools because uh, this isn't going to be isolated simply to um, to the world of of, uh, of public health. I, I did have a follow on question to that, and then I'll go back to the Q and A. Um, I take everything you say about empathy. Um, as a dean and as a member of the Hopkins leadership, we're facing a we face a difficult choice. Do we mandate vaccinate, assuming that these are FDA approved vaccines? Do you mandate vaccination for students, faculty, and staff? I won't ask you to comment on that particular issue if you don't want to, but how do you feel in general about mandating vaccination for certain, uh, not for everybody, but for you know, certain segments or certain professions uh, in society? Where do you come out on that? So I think it's a tricky issue. Um, for me, it's complicated by the fact that um, the vaccines that we have for COVID are not yet FDA approved. They have received emergency use authorization, which from the perspective of safety and efficacy, I am perfectly comfortable with that designation. That said, there is, it, is a, it is a different <laughs> um, uh, category than, than formal uh, approval. And so um, my hope is that we can get to a high level of compliance with vaccines, a high level of uptake, because people see them as I do, which is gifts that are paving the path to normalcy. And my concern is that um, these are new vaccines. I think we have every reason to believe in, the safe, in their safety and efficacy. And I do not believe that we cut any corners in, in developing them. In fact, one of the reasons why we were able to get to vaccines so quickly is unfortunately because so many people have become infected with COVID-19 that it made it much faster to complete the clinical trials than would have, other, would have been otherwise. I mean, it's the kind of good news, bad news story. Um, so it's not that these were rushed in any way. Um, you know, co coronavirus vaccines have been something that have been worked on for, you know, 15, almost 20 years. Hmm. Um, that said, they're new, and we unfortunately branded them with the name Operation Warp Speed, which I think has given people perception that this is something that was dashed off um, to, to meet an emergency situation, but you know, cut corners, which isn't true. But that what that means is that we have to do the work of educating and overcoming people's hesitancy. And so I don't like using requirements to shortcut that very important process. That mm. said, I think. While that's the goal, is that we get people to do this willingly, I can imagine that congregate settings, schools, and employers are going to want to use a requirement as a way for them to operate safely. Um, and so I think that that is a different story than um, absolutely, you know, requiring it for, um, you know, travel or, or other things. Um, 
I, I expect that businesses and schools will make it necessary, make it, make it a requirement, yeah. um, you know, but that to my mind doesn't negate the very important step that we have to do, which is to win hearts and minds and to convince people that this is something that they should do because it's in their best interest. Are the, are the indications that we're making progress? I was literally just before we went on um, reading an article in the Washington Post. I think Frank Luntz did a focus group with Republican voters. Uh, and although in a previous session, there had been movement on vaccines, this group, uh, they were listening, I think, to one of your um, one of your colleagues, in fact, uh, Tom Inglesby. They just weren't budging. Um, and they were, you know, the, just looking at how it was reported, it sounded like the talk was empathetic and informational and all that. And at the end of the day, you know, still kind of a bit of a brick wall. Do you think um, in this particular case, we're running up against reluctance that just won't yield? I think there's going to be some portion that won't yield, but I'm not giving up on people. And I do think that um, for some people, it's it's more just we have to repeatedly have these conversations and over time and as they see that it's rolling out and nothing's really happening and um, they see the benefits that their you know neighbors and friends are experiencing, um, that they will start to feel differently. Um, but, um, you know, I. Um, I I, I don't think that hesitancy is a fully fixed category. I do think that people's views change and we've already seen a narrowing in the polls of people saying that they'll never get the vaccine over time in part as, as we roll it out. Um, so, you know, I think there's always gonna be some people who have um, other, you know, ideological reasons to be opposed to it. My worry actually is that in making it a requirement in a lot of places that actually hardens people's ideals rather than converts them. Um, but, uh, you know, there are clearly going to be some people who choose not to. Um, but um, I, I do, I am hopeful that we can, we can reach people. I, I've been involved in a lot of conversations where by the end, I feel like we're in a much different place than when we started and we just need to do more and more of that. Yeah. A uh, question from uh, Pam Flaherty, a uh, SICE alumna, member of the Board of Advisors and member of the Board of Trustees of the University uh, and a good friend. Uh, can we be safer in this country without a vaccine for children? When, when will we have vaccines for children? Um, so for children 12 to 15 years, so 16 plus um, can be vaccinated. And for 12 to 15, that's probably the next uh, age group that um, we could potentially see vaccines available. Pfizer su submitted its vaccine for emergency use authorization in that age group. Um, and I expect, you know, in the coming months um, that we'll have a, a decision on that front. Um, you know, this is actually one area where there is a little bit of debate among um, epidemiologists as to how much a vaccine for children is needed. Um, we know that children um, are far less uh, likely to experience complications from infection as, as adults. That said, I think there are many parents who feel strange about the fact that they may be protected and their, their children aren't. And I, for that reason, I think having a vaccine would be helpful. Um, you know, some people very rightly point out that the risk benefit calculation for children is different because they do have different risks from the, the disease than adults do. Um, but I expect that there will be demand for vaccines in children. And so I, it's hard for me to imagine that um, they won't be made available. That said, in terms of whether we need it, I don't, I haven't yet been convinced that we need to vaccinate children um, for the reasons of, you know, getting back to safety. There, again, I think we have to remember that vaccines are not our only way to protect ourselves. They're, they're a great way. They're an important way. But until case numbers fall, we're still maintaining the norms of mask wearing in, in indoor spaces and trying to avoid, you know, crowded, crowded places and, and things like that. And those are other ways to, to protect your children. As more adults get vaccinated, case numbers will fall. And falling case numbers is also another way that children will be protected. So there's going to be multiple ways that children will be protected as vaccines are rolling out, even if they are unable to be vaccinated. That said, if there were a vaccine available today, I would 
get my kids vaccinated. Um, so there's a question from the point of view of a grandfather. Um, I notice, I know that with uh, my grandchildren, whenever it's cold season, you know, a day or two after they uh, they come over to the house and uh, yeah. crawl into your lap, uh, I come down with a cold, which usually lasts longer than theirs. Our, our students, are our, our not students, our children, um, particularly efficient as transmitters of viruses, or are they just kind of like the rest of us? It's just that they crawl in your lap and get in your face and um, it takes its course. So I'm sure those behaviors are part of the reason why children seem to drive transmission for a number of respiratory viruses. That said, we actually haven't seen that um, in with COVID-19. Um, kids are known drivers of community transmission of influenza, um, but we don't see that same phenomenon with COVID-19. Um, we know that kids can get it. Um, we know that kids can spread it, though less efficiently. And there may be biological reasons for that that are not fully understood. Um, there are some hypotheses, but it's not entirely clear. Um, but um, they aren't. There's not really evidence that um, kids are are driving community transmission. Um, some people say, well, you know, kids have been much more protected than adults, and so maybe that's why we haven't seen it yet. But um, you know, studies have often shown that when kids get it, it's usually an adult who who brings it home which is not what we see with other respiratory viruses. So that's been the one point of good news is that I think this pandemic has been so awful and for so many ways, but fortunately we haven't had to worry about our children as much as we yeah. could with other viruses. Yeah. Uh, Raj uh, Bardwi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Raj. Uh, with new variants uh, popping up, how vulnerable are people who are vaccinated to the new variants? So um, the good news is probably not very. Um, you know, there have been some concerns that um, for some of the variants, um, it uh, potentially lowers some of the protective nature of vaccines. But um, so far, all the evidence suggests that of the variants we've seen and the vaccines that we're using, especially here in the US, um, that you're still protected enough. Um, Obviously, the potential for that not to be true at some point is one of the reasons why people are worried about the variants. Um, and it's one of the reasons why it's been suggested that perhaps in the future we may need a booster or a third, you know, another another shot of, of, of a possibly different formulation of the vaccine. Um, I will say I think the jury is very much still out on that. And I, I there's um, sufficient levels of skepticism as to whether or not that's necessary, but it is possible. Hmm. Um, okay. Uh, I, well, I guess let me ask one, one other question on that. You know, again, I'm just uh, kind of ignorantly following the Israeli data. It, it, it does, you know, it seems to me from what at least I've read there and in some other places that even with some of the newer variants like uh, the South African variant uh, and of course the British one, which is more prevalent and maybe the Brazilian variant, that even when things like Pfizer or Moderna are somewhat less effective, the, the protection against hospitalization and death are still really close to 100%, which is feels sort of miraculous. And, uh, you know, in some ways, that seems, it seems to me to be the point. I mean, we've all got the flu and, you know, if you survive it, it's unpleasant, but that's about all it is. Is is that the case? And do you think that's likely to be the case? Yes. I mean, I think Israel's a great story because you know they had a they had a lot of B one one seven. That's the variant that um, was first identified in the UK. Um, and you know they rolled out vaccine and did all the public health measures that um, you know we've been doing for the last year, and were able to to drive their their case numbers down. Similarly. You know, the UK has has done those things too. So I am quite hopeful that the vaccines, even because even with the variants, are still um, helping us get to that place. And I think we have to remember that incredible um, contribution of vaccines to defang the virus. <laughs> you know, if they help take off the table the po potential for the virus to put people in the hospital or kill them, and if COVID, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 didn't put people in the hospital or kill people, you would have never heard about it. So I think we have to 
in my view, I think our, our understanding, I think our relationship of the virus is going to shift as, as when we get to the point of no longer being acutely worried about people um, having severe illness. Yeah. Um, question from Sneha uh, Mahapatra, um, a, a second year MAIA student from India. How do you think international public health institutions can play a more robust role to generate a more comprehensive and compelling strategy across nations moving forward? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think an area of, of sorely needed um, developments because you know, it's been really tough for countries to go it alone. I mean, to your, your first question was, this is this a global situation or a national one? I mean, this is a global situation. A country that decides to lock down and you know, implant, implement all of these measures um, is experiences difficulties when its neighbors don't. Even if they're able to restrict travel to and from and you know, completely seal their borders, which is very difficult to, to fully do, um, there's still then political pressures. Well, how come you know they have freedoms and, and we don't? So it would have been nice if we could have coordinated a bit better um, which measures we would use under what circumstances. I will say one of the concerns that I have is that um, countries have taken different measures for controlling the virus, and some of those have been quite appropriate for the circumstances in which they've been used, but they're not all broadly um, applicable. So, um, you know, Singapore, for instance, earns lots of credit for its um, contact tracing efforts, um, but they have utilized technologies in a way that I cannot imagine the United States doing, um, you know, where every adult has to have an app installed on their phone and children wear, um, uh, you know, Bluetooth um, enabled medallions to, <laughs> to, you know, track their whereabouts. I, I cannot see that happening here in the United States. And so, um, you know, while I don't imagine that's going to be adopted in the United States, I do think we have to have a conversation about um, what are the broadly applicable measures that have worked, you know, that don't require um, a certain political context in order to be uh, acceptable. I think we need to have um, more clarity on that and a better understanding of, of the approaches that work that don't also raise concerns about civil liberties and, and other things. Yeah, I mean, actually, there's a follow-on question from Sneha, which uh, I think um, is quite appropriate. And that's about the question of new digital data tools. You know, it, it is striking to me how much of the, you know, the measures you're talking about, social distancing, masks, and so on. Okay, that's sort of vintage early 20th century technology, and sometimes it's vintage 17th century uh, uh, kinds of solutions to a uh, to the problem have you know the information technologies broadly defined really transformed in some way our approach to the pandemic or you know only in a you know particular case like singapore where they you know the populace will go along with every kid having a medallion and being tracked by an app i i think i mean here in the united states no i would argue they haven't um could we have done more with technologies maybe but there were issues um, that we hadn't worked out in, in advance. So um, um, I think a number of countries did use digital technologies successfully, but um, I, it's not clear that that um, you know, was going to be an option for, for places like the US. Could we have gotten there if we had you know, socialized in, in, in advance, kind of worked through the ethical issues in advance? you know, talked about the, what it is and what it isn't, because a lot of times there's, you know, uh, a, a narrative, a false narrative of, you know, government tracking and, and all sorts of things. Um, you know, maybe we could have used more, but, you know, what I saw in the U.S. anyway, the rate limiting step was just, um, we didn't have the people that we needed to pull off those, you know, uh, 19th century <laughs> disease control measures. Um, other countries that had more recent experience with epidemics, learned the hard way the need for that and and built up those systems and we didn't um we though fortunately have the 21st century <laughs> tools of vaccines um but uh the the 19th century tools um we we've not um, made good use of 
Yeah, you know, when uh, just teeing off the, what you said about uh, the, the dealing with the ethical questions, one of the things that struck me throughout the pandemic is the extent to which the people who have thought most deeply about the ethical issues and sometimes come up with very finely nuanced solutions are not the people who are going to decide ultimately. You know, it's the politicians are not going to be are not particularly engaged in in those these sorts of debates until. Um, you know, they get hit in the face with a pandemic because they're worried about a million other things, whereas the bioethicists and so on will be kind of agonizing about it in great detail uh, beforehand. And there's a bit of a, a gap there. Uh, we're, we're coming close to the end. I, I wanted to ask, um, maybe to wrap this up, two questions. So the first question, sort of more the, um, uh, we'll begin with the dark side and then go to the bright side. The dark side is, I think it's a commonplace that when the lid finally comes off, so to speak, we're going to see uh, an enormous amount of second and third order damage that's been done by the pandemic and by the measures to control the pandemic. And I wonder if you would just speak to that. What's your assessment of that? How do you think about it? How should we think about it? How long will it last and so on? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's important to remember that pandemics harm in sort of three ways. There's the direct harms, the people who get infected, you know, hospitalized, die. Um, there's the people who suffer because of the disruption that the pandemic causes. So that could be health um, in, you know, the, the heart attacks that, that didn't get seen at the emergency room because people were afraid of going to the hospital amidst COVID or the cancers that weren't treated when medical systems scaled back on elective procedures. Um, there's that kind of secondary sort of those displacement, but also in there, it's not just health things. It's, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the children who haven't been educated for an entire year, you know, all of that kind of displacement um, impacts. And then there are the economic impacts so in my view, that, that those two categories, the displacement and the economic, we haven't yet fully seen the impacts of that. And I do have to say, when I'm talking about economic, what I, what I don't mean is this false narrative that you either protect the economy or you protect public health. That is just simply not true. You cannot have a robust economy if your population is not healthy. People are not gonna go out and spend money when they're afraid that they may die. Um, but we also can't have a healthy population if people can't pay to put food on their table and, and have a place to live. Um, so we, those, those two things, public health and economy are inextricably linked. Um, but I, we haven't yet seen the full economic fallout of this. And one of the deep worries that I have coming out of this is that governments are going to see what they just spent and what they just lost on COVID and re revert to austerity measures as a way of you know, building back up the budgets. And austerity is what probably undermined our public health preparedness in the first place. The global downturn of 2008 was probably the single biggest blow to the US public health preparedness because it led all sorts of governments to tighten things and, and get rid of people, the people that I said we just didn't have, uh, people and programs and capacities um, because you know it's easy to cut public health because hopefully you won't need it. Um, so I think those two things, and in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm deeply worried about the harms to children, not just here in the United States, but globally, those are gonna have decadal, decadal, you know, um, effects. We're, we're, we're gonna see the, the, the unveiling of how that's impacted our, our globe, um, you know, for, for 10 years or more, I think. Yeah. Okay, well then to try to end this on an update, now, note. <laughs> um, what, are, what are the ways in which you think we're going to come out of this stronger or better yeah, I, I i do think there are a few ways first of all as a public health person um i used to have people ask me what an epidemiologist is <laughs> people often thought it <laughs> was a skin doctor i'm not a skin doctor i don't think I, I do not have to explain myself anymore and i think that's important from a important because um public health has suffered from being something that you only see it when it doesn't work and you don't know what it is. So I think people understand now what public health is and all sectors of our society are seeing what's at stake when we don't have strong systems in place. And, and you know, that, that public health is, is foundational for countries' uh, economic prosperity, it's foundational for their national security. So I think that is an important 
reckoning um, that is happening now that I hope will continue for, for some time. Um, I will also say that I have been so incredibly touched by people's ingenuity and willingness to kind of pitch in and help in this situation. Um, social scientists tell you this is what happens in emergencies, uh, that um, when, when there's a you know, disaster or some kind of emergency, people you know, try to help. And I have absolutely seen that. I have seen all sorts of industries and companies and private citizens use whatever skills or talents they have to try to make the situation better. And you know, as much as we talk about the, the division in our society, I think there have just been so many acts of people reaching out to try to help and facilitate and, and participate. So I really hope that we can kind of build that, that on that kind of civic spirit that I have seen come to the forefront and just carry that forward um, because I think an active and engaged population is, is, um, is our best defense against a number of things. And I think apathy is not. And so it's hard not to have lived through this and, and feel apathetic. Great. Well, listen, uh, this has been wonderful. I'm just going to conclude by saying, um, in addition to saying, of course, thank you. And, you know, you're a very busy person these days to take an hour out uh, to be with us is, means a lot. But I'll also say that uh, I think for those of us who are not part of the health uh, uh, parts of Johns Hopkins, we're very proud of our colleagues uh, at the School of Public Health, of course, uh, the hospital, the medical school, the School of Nursing, uh, for all that they're doing on the front lines in a, what's been a grim situation for over a year. So um, we're, we're cheering you on and we're grateful and uh, wish you all the luck and uh, I will now be a little bit more willing to take my mask off outside. Thanks Just very outside. much. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it and all the work of this fine school. Thanks.